Today, we're going to be speaking with Claudia Golden, who's a professor of economics at Harvard University and author of the new book, Career and Family, Women's Century Long Journey Toward Equity. Uh, it's really great to have you on today. I appreciate your time. I'm pleased to be here. So I, I think maybe to start our conversation, it might be interesting as you catalog in the book to talk about some of the catalysts over the last hundred years that have led women to enter the workforce in greater numbers now that, than at any previous time. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the main highlights on these last hundred years? Cer certainly. So, so to begin with, in fact, the most important change in the labor force in almost every country in the world has been the increase of women uh, in the workforce. Uh, so, so this decision is sort of made by considering what we call the opportunity cost of, of being in the household. So when paid work is more remunerative, it, it's worth more relative to home production. You exit that household and you go to work, you know, and this can uh, come about because real wages increase. It can also come about because household production has better alternatives. All you have to think about is what it would be like to bake bread yourself rather than buying it. Of course, lots of people bake bread and they do a very good job. <laughs> but and, and it might also be furthered when social norms and traditions change. So you asked about uh, the catalyst. So technological change of lots of different types did it. So the most important ones are the ones that decreased the importance of what we call brawn work. Now, I'm really strong. I'm stronger than my husband, I know, but there are a lot of men who are stronger than I am. Uh, and it increased the value of brain work. That's really very important. So, uh, and then there are the technologies that made homes cleaner and their care less labor intensive. You know, we forget about the fact, we take for granted that we have clean water and sewage removal. We have flush toilets and central heating and household electricity. And finally, there are those that enabled women to control their fertility. It's really very, very important. And that led to an enormously large increase in the age of first marriage in as late as the 1970s, when uh, the birth control pill finally diffused among among young women. So the, those are the main ones. You um, have spoken about in, in the new book you talk about the significantly increased rate of women who get college degrees. And at a very top level, we know that at least right now, this may change, but at least right now, people with college degrees have higher lifetime earnings. Can you talk a little bit about the, the educational component to this as well? Sure. So I think that you're asking why it is that women versus men uh, get more degrees. So so the returns are extremely high on the margin. Uh, all these, you know, the vast majority of individuals who don't get a college degree would do much better if they if they did. That's not true for everyone, but it's true on the margin. Uh, but first, a few important facts that are generally not known. Uh, there have been more female college graduates in the U.S than male college graduates since around 1980. So therefore, it didn't happen yesterday. It didn't even happen 10 years ago. It began, believe it or not, 40 years ago. The second fact of importance is that when high school graduation was a really important milestone, uh, and when just 10 to 20 percent of the nation's young people would cross that threshold, and I mean like in the first quarter, century of the, the, the first quarter of the 20th century, uh, women were the vast majority of high school graduates. Okay. That's an important fact. And the third fact is that there are more female than male college graduates in virtually all the rich countries in the world. And even in the poorer countries, women are increasing their numbers relative to men. So we and to understand what's going on, we have to take all of this into consideration. So two facts or two notions. The first is that work for men is still partially brawn driven. So guys can still do construction work, go to any construction site. How many women do you see? Very, very few. 
Uh, and so men, even without a college degree, can still find uh, work that we used to call good work. It's become less and less good, although the demand for non-college graduates today is very hard. And the second point is that men, uh, let's call them males, because most of them are very young, don't get their act together until later in life. And this is reflected in just a host of risky behaviors from drugs to crime to those that result in their own bodily harm. And so those who study psychology and genetics can point to some of the underlying reasons. And it means that the boys don't write their college essays on time and they don't apply on time and they don't go. When we talk about this issue with most Americans who are sort of centered in the political debates of our time, a lot of the factors that you're talking about to build up this foundation of our understanding of the dynamics of the workforce often get sort of tested by the final output, which is what does pay look like and, and questions of pay disparity. And for a very long time, this idea of the 77 cents on the dollar was being floated about. Uh, about eight years ago, we did a kind of deeper dive into this. And and some of your research was actually part of of what we use to figure out what a maybe more accurate number is. And it seems that the 77 cent number is, is simply not an accurate number. From what I'm recalling now from the research, it seemed to be closer to 92 cents on the dollar, <laughs> some part of which might be due to discrimination. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? piece? Uh, OK. Okay. I know this is a huge can of worms. I understand. <laughs> As someone once said, a can of worms larger than the universe, <laughs> yeah. which is a little scary. <laughs> so the first thing is that, uh, first of all, it's not 77, it's 82, I believe. But it is an accurate number for something. Everything's an accurate number. If I told you the price of apples, you know, in the corner store, that would be an accurate number for the price of apples at the corner store. It may mean not be the correct number for the price of apples in San Diego or in Omaha. Um, so that that's part of the issue. So it is constructed <clears throat> by taking everyone in the current population survey, taking their weekly earnings for men and women and using only those who are full-time year round so that that sort of standardizes in some manner, not entirely, and then takes the median for women and the median for men and divides. That's a number. It's an accurate number for what it's doing. Okay, here's the inaccuracies. The inaccuracies are that uh, for each woman, the uh, amount that she receives relative to men changes over her lifetime. We know that. We know that for relatively young men and women, their earnings are pretty similar. You know, if I look at what happens to uh, college graduates or law school graduates, uh, uh, when they first leave, their earnings are very similar. And then over time, they diverge, and they diverge a tremendous amount for those at the highest end, the professionals, so lawyers, so uh, two lawyers might both, both go to a Park Avenue law firm, and then they marry, they have kids, and they realize it's unsustainable. And so what happens is that it's often the case that the woman will remain a lawyer, but move to a firm that's smaller and less demanding, less greedy, the difference between their earnings, that ratio isn't 77, it's not 92, it's often 64, you know. But we generally don't observe in census data, we're, we're, since we're narrowing this, we're looking at the medians, these are uh, the very, very upper tail. If we looked at the lower tail, then they're going to be far uh, more similar. It, it's almost ironic. I've often been asked, uh, isn't the gender gap wider at the bottom? <laughs> and I said, I'm going to be wider at the bottom. We've got a, uh, we've, we've got a, a bottom that's limited by the minimum wage. So it's not as if you have so much room at the bottom. You have a tremendous amount of room at the top. And so that's, that's the issue. 
So it is a correct number, but it's not a number that's going to tell us a lot about what's happening to uh, the uh, individuals as they go through their life cycle. That's very interesting. So and with your study being in economics, you're able to explore a number of different ways of measuring this, depending on what is the question that we are sort of trying to answer. And then it seems that a second layer on top of this would be if one wants to ask political questions or societal questions about discrimination, we need to be very careful about what are the numbers that we're considering, it sounds like. A absolutely. I mean, uh, it's my sense <laughs> that there's no question that there are disparities that we should eliminate. There's sexual harassment. There's uh, disparities in terms of the ability of individuals to go to a supervisor and ask for a raise. There is real discrimination. But it's my sense, and we have a lot of information that shows this, that even if we eradicated all of that, and I hope we do eradicate all of that, it's not going to close the gap because much of the gap is due to this notion of greedy work and the fact that in uh, couples that are different sex couples, they often uh, abandon gender equity, as I just said with the couple who graduated from law school. And when they abandon couple equity, they throw gender equality under the bus with it. When you uh, in the book talk about various anti-discrimination laws, um, training for people in managerial and supervisory positions, my understanding and my reading of it is you do find that these um, <clears throat> initiatives are valuable, but that they're not necessarily enough. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I would say that they're it's not that they're not necessarily enough. They're not really getting to the main problem. And when you if we really want to <coughs> fine tune or ascertain the problem, it seems there's a number of components to some degree. I mean, you talked about the dynamic within opposite sex couples and career choices that exist there. You talked about the difference between what we might consider uh, higher wage jobs rather than than middle or, or lower wage jobs. Can you talk to us about some of the other specific points that should be looked at when we are trying to identify exactly what the problem to be addressed is? Uh, certainly. Uh, so the the problem in many ways is that work, a lot of work is very greedy. And so when individuals, uh, couples are making these choices, they can uh, and and they have care responsibilities. They can both take the uh, more flexible job that allows them to um, respond to uh, emergencies, that allows them uh, a certain amount of flexibility without penalty. But if they do that and the world is very greedy, they're leaving a lot of money on the table. It's It's really as simple as that. Um, greedy jobs also impact those at the lower end, uh, but that's a somewhat different story. But it's it's the it, it's really the case that for uh, many uh, couples, uh, they're faced with a difficult problem as to whose career is going to uh, get the upper hand, let's say. But at the same time, it, there's no question that both members of the couple lose out because men lose out of the joys and, and uh, of, of seeing their family uh, in the same amount of time that, that women do. And women lose out because their careers are uh, in many ways lowered and they're lowered for their lifetimes. Last thing I want to ask about programs like universal pre-K, publicly funded child care, et cetera. It might seem as though if these are funded through taxes and they provide both parents, for lack of a better term, with a more equalizing opportunity to remain in the workforce in a more engaged way, 
it would seem as though programs like that might have an equalizing force. Is is that the case? Yeah. So uh, so let's think about it. There are three types of solutions. One is to lower the price of these flexible jobs, make them more productive. That that's the one that I that I spend a lot of time on. The second one is to lower the price of care of of children of not just children but of the elderly, and we uh, that's another set of issues. And the third type of solution is simply to change gender norms because if in fact, when given this choice, it was random, then you might throw couple equity under the bus, but you wouldn't throw gender equality under the bus with it. Okay, but let's talk about you. It's a somewhat separate issue to talk about universal pre-K and public funded child care. That would certainly change the price of care. It would drive it down uh, relative to the amount that you get from working. Uh, by the way, uh, it would uh, also be the case that if we change tax policy, that would, might be a, a good thing to do too. So if we didn't have joint returns, as is the case in Britain and Sweden, uh, then uh, uh, women wouldn't, uh, in some sense, be faced within the family by the higher uh, marginal uh, tax rate. So that would be a very good thing too. But the problem is that someone has to pay for universal pre-K and childcare. And the latter, childcare, it is extremely expensive, as anyone with children knows. I mean, everyone complains. It's very interesting that uh, everyone with children complains about the high cost of child care. And at the same time, they complain that child care workers are paid too little. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. That, Where do you think the costs well, come from? Right. It's, 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 it's a very, very simple point. If you have one child care worker for three children, just do the math. And it's very, very clear that if you're actually, if, if your childcare worker is well-educated, well-skilled and well-paid, it's gonna cost a tremendous amount. So these are decisions for the polities. Sweden decided that they did wanna go that route, not for infants, by the way. For infants, they uh, the one of the parents receives uh, parental leave and is paid for that. So as researchers, though, we can demonstrate that pre-K uh, increases the human capital of the next generation, universal pre-K. You didn't say pre-K, you said universal, and that's important. By involving the entire community is actually more effective than targeted pre-K. Um, so so that's uh, uh, sort of the answer. Universal pre-K would be very, very nice. I mean, let's face it. <laughs> we have public education. At what age should it begin? You know, at some point in the 1920s, 1930s, it was decided that it, we should push it to five years old or six years old and have this thing called kindergarten. Uh, at some point in the 20th century, we had universal kindergarten. So, uh, so there's no, it's, it, this is a matter of the age, uh, three-year-olds, four-year-olds can learn. <laughs> right. And so, <laughs> yes, spoken as someone who has a four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the new book is career and family women's century long journey toward equity. We've been speaking with the book's author, Harvard university economics professor, Claudia Golden, I really appreciate your time and your insights today. Well, thanks very much, David. I've enjoyed it.